adversity comes from the Latin word adverse or adversus um, and it means opposition. Adversity can lead to suffering, um, but adversity and suffering are not exactly the same. Adversity deals with the forces that act against that could lead you to suffering. The primary reason people suffer is lack of knowledge, ignorance. My people perish because of lack of knowledge. People suffer mostly because of what they don't know in life. Everything starts with thoughts. Thought. You are your thought. You can't rise above your thought. You are limited by your thought. As a man thinketh, so is a man. People are poor, not because of what they have or don't have, but because of the way they reason. People are rich because, because of the way they reason. If you had no goals at the beginning of this year, I guarantee you, you have not achieved much. You cannot achieve. Hi guys, it's Benzik. Good to have you once again on this special interview episode. And I have a very powerful and special guest beside me here. And his name is John C. Enelama. John C. Enelama is widely traveled apostolic leader, social reformer, pastor, teacher, mentor, discipler of men and women and author. John's primary calling is to strengthen the church by spreading the fires of revival and reformation. His burden is to help people and society transform through the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom and thereby fulfill the great commission. John is the president, founder of Kingdom Apostolic Revival Ministries, founding pastor, End Times Revival Ministries, and a co-founder of the Apostles in the Marketplace Network. John is the host of the radio program Lessons from the School of Life. John and his wife, Ngozi, also run the Institute for Success in Marriage program, which hosts the Marriage Works and Love Works session for married and singles, respectively. John, a graduate of County Surveying, Obafemi Awolowo University, Ileife, Nigeria, obtained his ministerial license from Spirit Life Bible College, Eve in California, and is a fellow of the Aspect Global Leadership Network. He is married to Ngozi, and they have three children, Isaac John, Shane David, and Joanna Pearl. So guys, that is it of our guest in this episode. And this episode is going to be series. We are going to talk about different topics on this episode. So this could be the first series of this episode. So if you are joining us, it depends on the time you may, you may be watching this video. The other series are going to be linked in the description. I'm going to attach them in the call card. So do watch to subscribe to this channel. If it is the first time of, of coming to this channel. And also turn on the post notification and share this video with someone. So guys, make welcome our special guest here, John C. and Elama. So, sir, thank you for joining me in this special interview. Thank you very much. What I shared about you, what, were, what I read about you here, I don't know if there's a little bit of story of yours that you can be able to share with your audience or something more you can have to say about you. Well, my father, who passed away in 1990, was a clergyman, was one of the, among the first batch of ministers trained by British Methodist British missionaries. Um, he attended Methodist College in Zuakoli, which was founded in 1923 by British missionaries. Um, first as a student, and then he came back and was trained as a catechist, and then became an ordained minister. Was a missionary um, among his own people and went as far as Benue State, Otubo, Otonkong, and places like that. Um, so my, my, my foundation is Methodism. Um, I grew up as a Methodist boy in the manse. Methodist preachers live in manses um, as founded by George Whitefield, John Wesley, Charles Wesley, and so on and so forth. Um, I attended Government College of Mwaiha for one year, then transferred to Federal Government College of Kigo where I finished. I did my next four years and then transferred to Ife. At the end of my secondary school education in 1985, I went to Ife to study quantity surveying. Um, it was while I was at Ife that I had an encounter that changed my life forever. I became what you call today a born-again Christian. And I gave my life to Christ, became committed to the Christian faith just beyond attending church. I became a practical Christian um, and that changed my life forever. And in the process, I found that I had a calling from God because I, I was hearing what I today call the, the calling voice of God. It was something speaking within me, asking me what was my greatest heart desire? What do I want to do? most out of this life. Ultimately, I found out that it was God calling me and I was a teenager then, so he was asking for my teenage years, which I eventually offered to him, um, you know, gave up some of the things I did, not because they were wrong, but because he was asking for them. I, I loved, I was passionate about soccer. 
I'm not sure the last time I played soccer because it, not, it had it placed a demand on my life. And um, and the rest is history. It's been a long journey that spanned three decades, more than three decades, 30 years, and counting. So I'm happy to be here today. Wow, that's great. That's great. So we're, we're going to be talking about adversity. Sure. So can you, what can you describe about adversity? Adversity comes from the Latin word adverse or adversus um, and it means opposition. Okay. Um, so when you talk about adversity, it means opposing. It means that something is acting in opposition to you. Um, and life is full of adversity. In fact, I is due to call it inertia. The fact that you don't want to get up and go because there's forces, right? You know, if you look at as you do these laws of motion, even the third law says that when two objects interact, that they exert equal and opposite forces. So to every action, there's a reaction. That's opposition. When you want to get up, something is pushing back. Uh, when you when you are full of ideas, something is making you to sit down, not to go. Um, and then many times you, you try to do things in life and it doesn't work the first time. It's adversity. Can adversity be described as suffering as well? Adversity, they are not exactly the same. Um, adversity can lead to suffering, um, but adversity and suffering are not exactly the same. Adversity deals with the forces that act against, that could lead you to suffering if you don't know how to handle them. Um, but the reason why I say it's not necessarily suffering is because sometimes God can arrange adversity for you, mm. but God doesn't send you to suffer necessarily he can allow you to suffer but he's not you know so they are related but not exactly so why do people suffer why do people suffer because of a lot of reasons people suffer the primary reason people suffer is lack of knowledge ignorance my people perish because of lack of knowledge people suffer mostly because of what they don't know in life because life is filled with principles if you understand the principles you naturally will rise to the top but if you don't know them it will you know because you know like for example if you don't do what you need to do when you ought to do it, mm. eventually you'll suffer because of it. Mm. You know, and if you do what you're not supposed to do, you also suffer because of it. For example, if you eat too much, you're sinning against your body, eventually your body will suffer and you'll suffer with your body. Mm. It can even lead to an early death because you're just, when you eat too much, you overwork your system because the body is a machine. So even if a car is always working, imagine if you don't pack a car to rest overnight, if you might imagine that you pack a car in the night as you're sleeping, the car is working. Mm. How long is the car going to last? So if somebody eats so much that when, when you're sleeping, your body is working, eventually your body will suffer. You suffer with your body. Ignorance. Wow. Um, but you mentioned the principles that life is filled with principles. Yes. Can you list some of the principles? You have like five or seven principles. Oh, I can list some of the principles. First, before I list them, it's, it's important for us to understand that in creating this earth, first of all, God did not need to create the earth. God lives in a world totally different from our world. He lives in a vast world. The Bible calls it the heaven of heaven, so far away. And then one day he said, I want to create a place called Earth among several planets. But this is the only habitable planet as we know it today, where people can live, other places you can visit. And so he created a place called Earth and placed a being, an entity, a being called man. And he wanted man to live on Earth and govern the Earth as he himself governs the entire universe. But in creating the Earth, God employed certain laws and subjected the earth to the same laws that as man discovers those laws, man will advance. And as man observes those laws, man will naturally rise to the top. What are those laws? The first law, the most fundamental of them all, is the law of thought. Everything starts with thought. Thought. You are your thought. You can't rise above your thought. You are limited by your thought. As a man thinketh, so is a man. People are poor, not because of what they have or don't have, but because of the way they reason. People are rich because, because of the way they reason. If you keep reasoning the right way, you're going to have everything you need. They're going to attract into your life because man, one of the laws also says that man is a, a living magnet and attracts into his life everything that he is. And that to change what he's attracting, he has to change himself. So there's law of thought. There's law of attraction, but I jump that law. The second law I call the law of goals. In, in creating the world, God had a specific agenda, even a time frame. He did it in seven days. I don't know whether those days are 24 hours, but he did it in seven days. On the seventh day, he rested. Number three law is the law of words. God spoke this entire universe. He commanded it into existence by the words that he spoke. Another law is the law of uh, what I call, let me, I don't want to jump too far. So I have words. Um, after the law of words, I have 
what I call the law of vision. Everything is created twice. Everything God did, he saw it before he did. When God said, let there be light, he could never have said, let there be light, except he saw light in the midst of darkness. So if you can't see it, you can't have it. It's a law. Then there's the law of faith. All things are possible. Nothing is impossible. In fact, if something does not exist and you desire it, God will create it just to satisfy you, which leads us to the law of prayer. You can ask God for anything. For the law of prayer, simply states, Say, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Don't, don't forget to thank God and keep on praying until you get the answer. It's the law of prayer. Whatever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive it. You will have it. Nothing is impossible to the man who can believe and the man that can pray. And then there's a law of decision. Nothing becomes dynamic until it becomes specific. You have to be decided. God decided to create the earth. It's a law. So if you don't know what you are deciding, you're not going anywhere. So there's the law of persistence. You don't give up. If you start something, stay with it. If you find that it's the wrong thing, change. But don't just do start and stop, start and stop. You will never achieve anything. And by the way, I mentioned the law of goals. I rush straight. I don't want to rush too much. But you know the thing about law of goals is that this is 2022. Today is the 31st of October, Monday. I can tell you now. Look back in the last 10 months plus. We're entering this 11th month tomorrow. If you had no goals at the beginning of this year, I guarantee you, you have not achieved much. You cannot achieve much without setting goals. Because if you don't have goals, if you're playing soccer without goals, it's confusion, chaotic. Ah, yeah, you have the ball. What do you do with the ball? If you, if you go to school and there is no semester, first semester, second semester, no goals, when do you graduate? If you start studying medicine, no end, no beginning, when do you become a doctor? So if you're living life, there are no goals. You're living in confusion. By the way, what will become your goals are your problems. Every time you have a problem, it becomes your goal. When you solve it, you say, what's the next problem? So, goals is a law. There are many other laws. We can talk about them. I've, I've listed a few. Yes. Now, you talked about prayer. Prayer. Praying and all of that. Sure. For people that don't pray, there are many successful people that we have that don't pray. It's not true. So, they pray. Uh, uh, yeah, thinking they don't pray. Okay. We, Dan Gote yes. invited Elder Felix Ohiwere to his office. Elder Felix is a pastor, an elder in the church. And when he came, he told the story, Elder Felix. He said that when he came, he was cautious. He didn't know how to behave because he's a pastor. He's an elder in the church. Dan Kote said to him, I invited you. I know who you are. Be natural. On, he said, on the desk of Dan Kote is all things are possible. Everybody prays. If they don't pray, they pray when they're in trouble. There Everybody are, prays. There are many wealthy nations that are unbelieving nations. That doesn't mean they don't pray. Trust. It's just, it's just that they're not religious. They, yeah, they're but they're they not pray. religious. Yes. But they pray. Yes. So let's look at examples of wealthy nations. Dubai. They are Muslims. They pray five times a day. Yes. Which other country? South Korea. They pray. America was founded on prayer. Prayer is asking favor from a supreme being. The thing that we'll be talking about is that there are many people that are not religious. But sometimes people are religious. They're not spiritual. Religion means go to church, go to mosque. Spiritual means that you are conscious of the laws. I was told a story. A businessman who attended a particular church in Nigeria has a partner who is Indian who came to visit in Nigeria, came to visit in Lagos. And he said he went to the open market and saw people cheating people. He called a friend and he said, the pastor, the senior pastor must have told this story. And I heard he said, he told his friend, your people are religious but not spiritual. Mm. They are religious, they go to church but not spiritual because they don't know that if you cheat somebody, somebody will cheat you. Mm. Spirituality is that whatever you sow, you reap. Religion is going to church and coming back and still not changing. So, the thing that, the point maybe you are trying to make is that great nations are not built on prayer. They are built on hard work, yes. diligence. They are built on laws. Dubai is not built on prayer, per se. It's built on laws, principles. So, but the distinction which you are looking for is that you may know the principles, work the principles. It will work for you. But if you don't know the principle, at the end of time, you go to hell with all your success. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, has there been any time you've experienced any form of adversity and how were you able to... Oh my you? God, my life is full, filled with... I spent an extra year, if not extra years in Ife. I went to Ife in 85, I finished 92. At least that's what my certificate is. Adversity, yes. Yeah, share some of them that you have personally handled. Adversity, I can share so many. So, okay. one of adversity is when you start a project, you don't know what to do. When I, as a student, I didn't have the right mindset at that time. I took it seriously. 
Sometimes you go to a class. I remember taking a class in material and, meta material and meta metallurgical science, MME. Okay? It was an elective. And I remember the professor. First of all, it was very abstract. Bar one, one, bar two. I don't know what they were talking about. I came to class. The professor stood up in class the first day. He said, in this class, A is for me, B plus for my wife. If you do well, you get a C. I thought he meant it. So I took it to heart. But then the class was so abstract. I was lost in class. But then I, because I had been in school and I faced adversity, I now had to go to the library, had to talk to people who were in that faculty and department, and then I had to find material. I had to bury myself until I understood the subject. I eventually made an A. But let me tell you examples of adversity. They are driving. I started driving at 17, which is not too early. In, in the in Abia State where I was, you know, was born. And then after a few driving lessons, not a driving school, I, I was going somewhere just to practice. And my car was full of friends. I'm, I'm not yet good at driving, but because you're among your peers, I was, you know, on my way to the city, I entered into a gallop <laughs> and I lost control and the car hit a tree. I tell you, that thing happened so quickly that I didn't drive for the next 10 years. I was, it affected me. I was 27 when I got my license and I was now living in America and I was dodging driving because that memory stayed on. I said, wow, in 10 seconds, a few seconds, that happened. That's where I was then. One day, I came to understand that if you're 27, you really don't drive, you're handicapped. Mm. So I, I knew that immediately I was getting handicapped. 27, you don't drive? I had to go to driving. I mean, I had to, I had a friend who had a car. I immediately read, do the, did the computer test, passed, and did my driving lesson and passed. So I got my lesson, but I tell you that I was traumatized by that. It was a form of adversity. Then I look back in life. There's so many things, so many times I started projects and I will encounter opposition or difficulty. I'm a pastor of a church. I've worked with many people in the last several years, in the last 20 years, 20 plus years. Sometimes as a pastor, you find that people might have a different idea of church. You may be pastoring, People will be talking about a different thing in church. They may be having a meeting over your meeting. I've experienced that as a pastor. It's adversity. You know, it, maybe they don't understand what they're doing. And I can think about, um, what else can I give as an example? What about maybe um, when I lived abroad? I, I, I lived there. The first time I went to the U.S., I went with visa. Um, my visa expired. And then I, was, I needed to come back to ask myself, okay, so where do I live? Do I live there? I said, I can't live under the table. I can't live in a country where I don't have access to come in and to go out. You know, that was a form of challenge. I decided to return to Nigeria. I said to myself and to God, I said, the God that can't give you permission to enter a country where you are hiding the country cannot be my God. I just showed up. I said, when it's time, that God will take me back. If there's a calling for that country, all those things involve adversity. But let me say something. We have to understand about adversity. Because of the meaning, opposition, Throughout your life, there is anything that is easy is useless. Nothing significant in this life is easy. People have um, what I call um, a wrong motion of view of life. Let me explain it like this. I think the average person underestimates the price of being successful in life. Okay. The average person underestimates the price of being successful in life. So sometimes you approach that thinking people are doing well because it's easier or because they are smarter. No, they are doing well because they are overcoming adversity continuously, continually. They are fighting for their life. There's no business that is successful that has not overcome adversity. Nobody can do anything significant in this life, anything worth its name that will not overcome so adversity. Are you saying it's, not, it's not possible for anybody to avoid anything like adversity. Is it possible? If you avoid adversity, you'll be totally mediocre in this life. You'll be worth nothing. Hmm. It's by pressure you rise in life. If a plane avoids pressure, it will stay in the tarmac. It has to rise, it has to overcome pressure. It, it has to, I mean, it's the law, the third law of motion. It has to be pushing down pushing pressure down in order to be lifted up. Opposite and equal reaction. So what's the best way to deal with adversity? Powerful question. Very important question. First, adjust your mindset. You have to put on a warrior mentality. Number two, 
You have to put on a mentality that is persistent, never gives up. Number three, you have to count the price of living life on earth. If you don't want to pay a price, die. If you're going to live, there is a price for everything that's important. Jesus himself said, I must walk the walk of him that sent me. For the night cometh when no man can walk. Walk means walk. Walk means sweat. If you're thinking, I'll live by favor, I'll be so favored by God, I'm going to be bouncing up and down. Life on earth is governed by walk, fixed laws. If you don't walk, you don't get much. You can't live by favor. No, you can't build a nation by favor. You build nations by hard work, diligence, effort. You can't, do, you can't even live life by miracles. Miracles are the exception, not the rule. This earth is a material world. It's governed by laws. You determine your score in jam by the effort you put in. If you want higher score, work harder. You can't take jam by prayer. No, you take jam by hard work. You go and read. He that does not work will not eat. So, how do you... Go by, going back to the question, one of the essential passages, James, who was an apostle, wrote a general apostle in the Bible. He said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. But he says, you can only count it joy if you know this, that your temptations or trials or problems are the trying of your faith. Every time a man is in trouble or under pressure, it is a man's faith that is under test. Will you believe enough in God and your God-given ability to walk through the pressure? If you give up, you give up. And you never know what you give up when you give up. He said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trial of your faith develops patience. The word in Greek is hupo mene, hupo under mene, to abide. It means staying power. In other words, in this life, the only way God develops staying power is by taking you through adversity. Adversity is a plus. A blessing. It's by adversity you grow in life. And Christians love God. Sure. You go through adversity, even though. Why not? Because because adversity is promotional exam. You do go to primary school. I don't know how old you are, but I'm, I guess you are much younger than I am. When I was in primary school in the seventies, I did primary school in seventy four and nineteen eighty. The third term exam is called promotional exam. That ex if you like, be the best student first term, second term. If you fail third term, you repeat the class. Adversity is promotional exam. The only way you rise in life is by overcoming adversity. What made David great is killing Goliath. To kill Goliath is adversity. He had to overcome himself, overcome Goliath. If you avoid your Goliath in your life, you will be immaterial, unknown. David was unknown, insignificant. The day he killed Goliath, he became a great man. Now, is there anything like self-inflicted adversity or yeah. every adversity comes from God or is natural or is an encounter with destiny or there's something that you can say this is self -inflicted. So we have to understand, you know, words are very powerful. You have to be careful about words. So there is suffering, there is adversity, there is mistake. Mistake is not adversity, but mistake can lead to adversity. What I mean by mistake is that <laughs> if you're supposed to have driver's license, mm -hmm. you don't have it, you're driving and the vehicle catches you. You go through trouble, but it's self-inflicted. Why are you on the road without your license? You can't be calling the government official. Maybe you, when when the, the vice president, His Excellency, mm. was the Attorney General of Lagos State, he used to he said he said himself. I heard him say he used to get a lot of calls from Christians who run into trouble, and they call him as the Attorney General of the state. What did they want him to do? They caught you for doing one way. You're calling the Attorney General of the state. Should he legalize illegality? That's self-inflicted. Why are you driving one way? That's self-inflicted. But I'm saying that even if you do things right, you do right, you drive the right way. In this life, there'll be problems that come your way because problems are opportunities. Nobody grows in life except by solving problems and overcoming problems. Then how do you differentiate self-inflicted ones and the ones that I encounter with destiny? Because Anybody that is going through adversity in a form of suffering, how would the person know that, okay, this suffering I'm going through, it's because destiny makes it so, or God wants me to go through this suffering for training, or it is because this is what, there's something I'm not doing, or there's something I'm doing wrong with. I, I think it's about mindset and definition of words. Words are very powerful, words are very important. So listen to this again. Adversity, adversus, opposition, mistake. I didn't do what I'm supposed to do. 
they are related, but they are not the same. So, somebody gets married. Let's use marriage as an example. There's opposition to marriage. Not your spouse could be used, but it's not coming from your spouse. Because life is spiritual. Listen to this. Marriage is the most, is the most, I, I, I usually say, is the most challenged institution on earth. Why? First, marriage is God's idea. Secondly, marriage says, there's a law that says, if any two of you shall agree in prayer, that whatever you agree, that God who lives in the heavens will answer you. So it means that potentially, a couple can change the world around them. Because it means that they can agree in prayer, anything, and God will do it. Because there's a law. It's a law of prayer that says, if two of you agree on earth, as touching anything shall ask, shall be done for you of your God, your Father in heaven. So it means that marriage potentially is a very powerful institution. The enemy, there's an enemy to our soul. By the way, the primary fundamental source of adversity is the devil. He's the one that is challenging us. That's why I say life is spiritual. So what the enemy does, the devil, is that it will make couples to be attacking each other so they never live in agreement. So people have a saying that if you see two people, female, male and male, male and female, in a car, and they, they are looking harassed, stressed, angry with each other, their husband and wife. If you see them chuckling, laughing, happy, their boyfriend and girlfriend, they're not yet married. Because marriage is challenged. Now, adversity is that you are doing your best, but you are having issues. Mistake is that you're not doing what you're supposed to do. You don't know how to talk. You talk to your spouse, whether you're male or female, and you talk down on them, or you get angry and you're shouting. That one will lead to adversity. But you can change the way you talk. The problem is you. You haven't gone to the school of vocalization like my friend Adekomi will teach. How to talk, saying the right thing, the right way, at the right time. So, so my response to that question is that self-inflicted adversity is when something happens because of what you didn't do or because of what you did you shouldn't have done. But adversity is, it doesn't matter what you did or didn't do. Even if you are doing right, you are going to witness opposition in this life because to every action there is a reaction when you are, when you want to go to school you face adversity when you want to build a build a bank do any project they're going to face oppositions from men from spirits from all kinds of things but fundamentally it's coming from the enemy of our soul because the bible says something that is very simple but very profound it says for though we walk in the flesh we do not walk after the flesh okay it says and therefore the weapons of our warfare are not human they're not fleshly they're not carnal but they're mighty in God to the pulling down of strong goals, mindsets, and so on and so forth. You know, and it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against an organized system of evil. So what it does mean is that you have to be careful in life to say, what is the source of the adversity I'm facing? But whether you face adversity is guaranteed. You cannot, you cannot rise in life without overcoming opposition, adversity. At what point will someone be, be expecting, okay, there will be a breakthrough, there will be hope. When the person is working, he's doing everything right, with the person's mindset and the person's belief, everything that needs to be done, the person is doing it, but still suffering all around. There are no breakthrough. At what point will the person say, ah, this is okay, this, is, this should be the stop for it? Let's go back to where we started from. What I would like to say is this. Mindset. What's your mindset? That statement you made, is a mindset, comes from a mindset that is thinking that's a shortcut in life. They're looking for shortcut, easy way out. Listen, in this life, you want to make a difference? You want to succeed? Depending on how you define success, you want to make a difference, you want to make a contribution, you want to change your world? You have to put on the mindset that never gives up. You have to put on a mindset that says that life is hard and challenging. Life was not made to be easy in the sense of by easy, what I mean that is that you have to get up and do something. The butterfly will never be the butterfly if you didn't struggle through pressure, through the lava stage, and then go through that entire process and become. If you help the butterfly in the process of becoming, it will never become. So, the Bible says something. It's a very powerful book. It says, out of weakness, they were made strong. He says they became valiant in battle. He says our light affliction, which is but for a moment, 
works for us a far more eternal way of glory. You know what it means? Affliction means telepsis, problem, trouble. It can lead to adversity. It can even is is a synonym of adversity. Affliction in this life, he says, that the issues you face in life, you want to build a school. It's not that easy. You want to be the president of a country. It's not that easy. You want to be a banker. You want to be anything. It's not that easy. And he says that when you are trying to become, that the challenges you face, the problems you might have, he says it's affliction, adversity, but it's light in comparison to eternity. He says it's a small thing. It's not a big thing. He says that adversity or light, affliction, he said make it work for you, not against you. How? Mindset. So, look, I've done many projects in my life. I used to give up very easily before now. When I realized, my God, that's the wrong mindset. That's why I spent an extra year. When I adjusted my thinking, whoa, and I realized that nothing significant will come. It's just get, get on with the job. Wake up every, I wake up every day and I go. I don't complain. No, I don't sit down with people. Nigeria is this, Nigeria is that. What do you expect Nigeria to be? The problems you're seeing is, is the key to Nigeria's greatness. Solve them. Every problem is a key to, is an opportunity for greatness. We don't have power. Solve it. You don't have water. Solve it. You have a leadership challenge. Solve it. There's corruption. Stamp it out. Don't complain. He said, but everybody cannot do that. Yes. But you should not aspire to become a leader except you are willing to solve and resolve those issues. That's how nation become. Now, we have so many poor people in this country. Sure. So, are you going to say the poverty that is ravaging this land? Yes. Is not only citizens okay. or government policies mm -hmm. or destiny of God? How but, very powerful question. So let's, let me tell you a story. It started with Terah, Abraham's father. And then Abraham, God spoke to Abraham, Genesis 12, and says, I'm going to make you a great nation. And then Abraham didn't have a child for a long time. Eventually, out in his old age, he had a child, Isaac. And then Isaac had, you know, children, Jacob and Esau. Jacob became Israel. Became Israel. And Israel was the one that the covenant came from or came to. And it became the nation of Israel. God spoke to Abraham, who became a person, said, your people will be, they will be slaves in a strange land. 400 years. They eventually spent 430 years. There was a gap. I don't know why, but we can figure it out. And do you know that eventually a day came, they left Egypt, the land of their captivity, and they were on a journey to the promised land. Between Egypt and the promised land, listen to this, very simple, but very profound. Between Egypt and the promised land, all Israelites were equally rich, equally poor. No enterprise, no entrepreneurial activity. God fed them in the wilderness for 40 years. They ate the same food, drank the same thing. Their clothes grew on them. Their shoes grew on them. The same quality because they left Egypt harnessed on their way to the wilderness. When they came to the borders of the promised land, God said to their leader, Joshua, he said, you're about to enter the promised land. Now, listen, there will always be the poor among you. But from this time onwards, people will become in life what they decide. Enterprise. God doesn't create poor people. People become poor by their choices. So, choice. Poverty is not destiny. It's a choice. It's your choice that makes it your destiny. What is poverty? God did, it, God did not create anybody without talent and ability. It doesn't matter where you start from. How you're born is where you start life. It's not where you end. There are many people that are multi-billionaires in any currency who started poor. In this country, you have them. Because carries. There are many of them. How did they become who they are? Choices. So, to be poor is a choice. But a nation can also make that choice for its people by its lack of development thereof. Okay, because I have a doctor who used to be a member of my church who is now late. He died on an accord between CMS and the stadium. He's a trained doctor. He should never have died. A doctor in this, this same country will never be found on top of a bike. A doctor. After how many years of training? For him to be on a bike means that Nigeria stole his life. So your country, it's called HDI, Human Development Indices. Yes, they measure, what it really means in layman's language is that if a person is born in Osaka, Japan, and someone is born in Omaha, Abia State, in Nigeria, someone is born in Los Angeles, in California, in America, the same day, 14th October, 1969, what is the probability that each of those people will reach their full potential in life and fulfill their destiny? That's a national answer. It depends on the country. How the country. Yes! If you are born in America mm. and you are willing, you can rise to the top. Because if you give you everything, if Obama was a Nigerian, Obama may be a truck pusher right now. Wow. 
Yes. He became president because he was born in America. If, he, if Obama, with due respect, was born in, in Kanu, in Nigeria, and was born in Nigeria to Nigerian parents, nothing is guaranteed. He will be who he is today. Why? Nigeria. It's a Nigerian factor. Yes. So, there are many factors, reasons, but I can tell you that the, the most fundamental reason are the choices people make in life. So, how do we deal with the Nigerian factor? We have to pay the price to become a great country. Part of the price is election is coming. How do you vote? Unless the right person becomes leader, the process might not start because everything rises and falls with leadership. Mm. If you don't have a leader that is solving a national problem, if you don't have the best and brightest in our country solving our most complex problems, Nigeria will never become a great country. Now, the challenge now is that even if people want to do the right thing, in this country or to vote the right leaders do you think poverty is one of the reasons that has eroded values on making people to do the right to yes, vote but, the right candidates and all of that yes but and how can that help people? how did other nations evolve did you know a few years ago i had a meeting or we had a meeting in lagos one of our speakers was british and he said my mother is still alive she's british she went to primary school with no shoes on her feet is there a country that has not known poverty Everybody starts in poverty. America started in poverty. In the first year, the pioneers who pioneered America, many of them died of cold, heat, of, of winter. They entered, they, they, did it, they died. The winter killed some of them. There were issues with India, American Indians and so on and so forth. Countries evolved, not because of lack of poverty, but, because, but despite the poverty. We have to overcome ourselves. Listen, nations are like people. You can't say the reason I'm poor is because I'm poor. I was born poor, I die poor. No, you don't have to die poor because you are born poor. You are poor. You started life poor. Make choices. It may be difficult. Overcome yourself. Stop making decisions. Fight the fight of a lifetime. At what point do, do I give up? At what point will someone give up? After working so many work, facing adversity, do you think there should be a point in that person should say, no, this, I should give it up because it's not my calling or the person should see continue because you said destiny is all about adversity. Life. But at what point should someone give up and at what point should the person present? Life, sir. Despite the adversities. Life is about choices. You make up your mind. If you give up, you never know what to give up when you give up. If you give up and you die, you're dead. We can't do anything about that. It's about choices. I, I will never ask myself or my children. I will never train my children to say, at what point do you give up? I will never give up in this life. It's a mindset. My children will never give up. The way I'm raising them, they can't give up. They will overcome every challenge they face in life. It's a mindset. My father trained me not to give up. I had 10 children. All of them were graduates before he died. I, wonder, well, I guess the oldest got her degree after my father passed away. But all of us, my father didn't give up. He didn't train graduates because he had the resources. He trained them because he decided education is important. The choices you make in life will make you. You make choices, they make you. If you give up, you give up. It's a choice. So giving up is a choice. It's a choice. And making decision it's is a, a choice. choice. Yes. What do you think about uh, this uh, scenario of people talking about uh, uh, there, there are no opportunities in this country and their only hope is to jackpot. That's what they call pa this pandemic that they call jackpot, which is going out of the country to the Western nations. That is where they feel their opportunities. Do you think anybody that has the opportunity to jackpot to leave this country to go to other Western nations just for the sake of survival due to this Nigerian syndrome? The person should go or you think that everybody should just face it here? Let me say that in life, you should never be running from something. You should always be running towards something. If you are leaving Nigeria because you are running from Nigeria, you are making a colossal mistake. Nothing guarantees you survive and make it where you are going because you lack what it takes. You are running from something. You should run towards something. The principle of life, life is about principles. Every great country was built by men who didn't run away from their countries. Those who leave Nigeria to go to other countries, they are going to enjoy the works of other men. They should do it with dignity. Don't just show up in Canada and be thanking God. Canada was built by Canadians. Let me tell you the law of life. God said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, Let us create this earth and divide it into nations and give Canada to Canadians. Give America to the American Indians. 
Give Nigeria to Nigerians. Give Kenya to Kenyans. Give Sierra Leone to Sierra Leoneans. Let us hide and watch and see what each of these people do with their country. The Canadians developed Canada. The American Indians were there inside the bush. Europeans came from Europe and developed the country and built a superpower. There are moral issues there, but that's what happened. They gave Kenya to Kenya. They gave Ghana to Ghanaians. Ghanaians are trying. They gave Nigeria to Nigerians. Most Nigerians are shipping out of Nigeria. But God is watching. Only Nigerians can change Nigeria. Every problem in Nigeria is an opportunity and seed for greatness. What are our problems? We don't have power. But you have to, over 200 million people. Generate power. You have water. You have a dark ocean. What's your problem? What's our problem? Corruption. What is corruption? Morality. People don't know the price of corruption. People don't know that when you land at the airport and people are following you, they want to carry your bag, or they, you go to the toilet to use yourself, somebody's there with toilet roll. Nobody will ever do that in America, holding toilet roll. They have so much dignity for man that a man cannot be holding toilet roll for another man. But it's poverty because the other man says, if I don't do this, I have no other job. But they are, they are dehumanizing people. Right, let me say this. Nigeria is a land of extraordinary opportunity. Where are the opportunities? In our problems. Every Nigerian problem is a seed and a key to greatness. Every problem, whether it's lack of power, whether it's lack of water supply, whether it's lack of housing, whether it's corruption in leadership, they are all problems. They are all solvable. They are keys to greatness. What the average Nigerian needs to do is to adjust their thinking, to know that where there is problem, there's opportunity. Now, do you think it's about thinking or you think it's about the environment? Because if as a very good doctor, you do not have the environment to thrive in this country, do you still remain inside in the country because you want to thrive? Or you should go where they give you the environment to thrive? It's all of the above. Are there doctors that are thriving in Nigeria? There are so many world-class businesses. They think locally. They think globally, they act locally. There are so many, in every field of human endeavor, there are schools in this country built by Nigerians who started from poverty. The waterman was built by a man, he's dead. Go and look at his background. He's a, the second MD of GT Bank. Go and find out where he started from. He built a world-class school. How? He worked hard. He's not rocket science. People came from Britain, calling colonization. They built government college of College, these were ordinary people, missionaries. They didn't have much. So it's about mindset. It's not about environment alone. There are, there are environmental factors. But I'm saying that Oyibo man came to Africa. Listen, when missionaries came to Africa, they, gave, they said, give us land to build schools. Do you know the land they gave them? Forbidden land. They said, that land, go there and die. The Oyibo man didn't believe in that. They didn't die. They took the land, built schools. Yes, the land that we said is forbidden, the spirit is living there. They went there, no spirit was found there. Because hmm. what you believe will kill you. Yes, you believe in spirits, they will kill you. You don't believe in spirits, they can't kill you. Oh, you both man, they gave them forbidden land all over the east. I don't know about other parts of the country. They entered it, built schools, built things, they didn't die. Mary Celeste came from there, from a, a rich background, came and lived in Nigeria, transformed lives. Let nobody make excuse because of environment. There are environmental factors in success. But I tell you what, your mindset will lift you above all problems. And then when you connect that to God, the maker, who says with me all things are possible, nothing can stop you. So now what, what do you think is the primary difference between a, an average man in the West and an average man in Africa? Well, that brings your point. The average man in the West grows up in a place he's never seen power outage. Mm. When there's power outage, they die of, of stress. Wow. If they take light in New York, the state, might, the state might pay them stress allowance. If you take life for a day in New York, they might pay them stress allowance. Seriously? Yes, because they, they don't know anything like that. They don't know what it means for there to be no light. Look, I go to America. I've lived there for a season. I look for overhead tank. I'm seeing water running. I say, where's the overhead tank? I don't see. I look for pipe, I don't see pipe. Then I now track the water to water works. You don't have water in your house in America because you're rich. You have water because you're a human being. When I first went there in 94, I rented a house for the first time in 96, after two years of being a student in California, Orange County. When I rented the house, the phone company called me, the phone company, and said, when do you move in? We want to activate your phone. 
they will not rent a house to you except it has power, gas, and all the amenities. If it doesn't have those things, the house is not rentable. Wow. The government will not allow anybody to live there. When you grow up in an environment like that, and you grow up in, the, in, in a part of the world where you use lantern for your degree exams, you don't have the same mindset. But remember, however, that sometimes capacity in life is fueled in the furnace of adversity. Mm. Yes. You can become more resilient in life because of what you've been through. Mm. So you can, you can take advantage of the opportunity in the opportunity, in the lifetime of that opportunity to become great in this life. Don't let your challenges push you back. Sometimes, God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, creates adversity in order to produce a different set of human beings on whom he can depend upon to achieve a different set of results. Listen, something about Africa, you must not forget. It's called the dark continent, yes. Nigeria is called it. It's the most populous black nation on earth. Nigeria has a calling from God. Many of our problems as a country have been allowed by God. Some of them created by God through human failures and human mistakes. Mm. But to produce a set of people, an arising people, arise old compatriots, mm. through whom he can partner with at the end of time to make a difference globally. Mm. That's the purpose of a Nigerian nation. He wants a set of people, blacks, living among themselves, that he can work with all over the world especially to export the values of his kingdom. As the West is turning upside down, man is marrying man, woman is marrying woman. They can't defend, define male and female. It's a problem. But Africa doesn't have that problem yet and may not have it because part of their calling is to show the world that God is a God of absolutes, not relativity. In particular, as we round up this session, what are the five things you can tell anybody now going through adversity? Just five things, practical things the person can start doing, maybe to start coming out of it gradually or to overcome it at the end of the day. If you're in a very difficult place, yes. to eat is a problem. Yes. You don't even have a place to sleep. The future looks bleak. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the economy has a free fall almost. Things are multiple times more expensive today than they were eight years ago or five years ago. <clears throat> Maybe you've gone to school, you've graduated, and you really don't know what to do. Here are things I suggest. Number one, don't give up. Because when you give up, you don't know what to give up when you give up. Don't give up. Number two, believe in God. Believe in God. I'm not asking you to become religious. Believe in God. Believe in God. There is a God in the heavens that rules in the affairs of men. I will even encourage you, give your life to him through the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's the only name under heaven given amongst men whereby he can be saved. There's no other name that can get you saved. That's an absolute. Somebody may argue. There's no room for argument now. Yes. You can say, what about this? What about that? Well, I don't have all the answers, but I do know that changed my life forever. Number three, adjust your thinking. Don't you put on the mentality that there is a shortcut in life. You are going to walk your way through this life. You have to be willing to pay the price. There is a price tag for success. So, number three is change your thinking. Number four is be willing Despite your sufferings and challenges, despite where you're starting from, be willing to pay the price of success. Mm -hmm. Don't be looking for shortcuts, is what I'm saying. There's no shortcut. Every shortcut you take will cut you short of that place you're going. Mm -hmm. And the final thing is that I want you to have a solution mentality. Say to yourself, I don't have the answer, but I'm going to be part of the solution. Instead of enumerating the problems, going to beer parlors, people are hanging around, mm -hmm. drinking, eating ngongo mm -hmm. and isiwu, and just talking and talking. Mm -hmm. Leave talk alone. Make up your mind. I'm part of the solution. The final thing I'll say: be open, be flexible. 
In fact, I will even say, go to school, formal and informal. Listen, you say, I don't have anything. Yes, education is not all formal. Begin to educate yourself. Any opportunity to learn, to read a book, read. Because if you keep seeking for knowledge, if you keep seeking, in despite your poverty, don't make your, don't make your material poverty to be a mental poverty. Mm -hmm. Educate your mind. Don't let your environmental factor to become a mental challenge. Educate your mind. If you keep seeking for knowledge, a day will come when you, despite where you started from, become a fountain of knowledge. In that day, you will know that knowledge will put you over the top, especially if you partner with God. Mm. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so much for this particular uh, episode. It's really wonderful and it's mind-blowing. So, guys, th that is it we have for adversity. And within the course of this, uh, this particular interview, I, I believe you've been hearing him talking about mindset, mindset, mindset. So the next episode is going to be on mindset, developing an Olympic mindset. So depending on the time you'll be watching this video, the woman have, that may have been posted also, you may see it in the... Uh, description or I will share it also in the call card by the end of this video so you should watch out for that so you can understand how you can develop the right mindset for your business for your life and everything in general so thank our guests for this particular one John C and Elama so I thank you very much for thank this uh, particular one so guys that is it for this you can click here to watch the other episode or click this other place to watch the second one Thank you so much. My name is Basic. Subscribe to this channel if you're yet to subscribe. And I'll see you again. Cheers.